My name is Yuri, and I used to be a physicist. Nowadays, I'm just a software developer, but I used to work four years uh, at the Large Hadron Collider, so I'm going to tell you something a little bit about it. So first of all, what is the Large Hadron Collider? It's currently the biggest particle accelerator in the world. It's located at CERN, which is the European Organization for Nuclear Research, at the Swiss-French border. And here is a picture of the CERN site. Somewhere there is a building that I used to work in. Uh, the circumference of this particle accelerator is 27 kilometers, and it's on the average 100 meters below the ground. It's uh, because there's this is a mountainous area, and by the way, the area is great, so you should totally go there and check it out, even if you're not interested in physics. Um <coughs> So it's between 50 and 175 meters underground. And this is actually a picture from the tunnel itself where the accelerator is located, and this is the pipe where the particle beam is uh, going around the circle. So how does this work? How do particle accelerators work? Uh, we use electric and magnetic fields. The electric field is used to give charged particles a kick. Every time a charged particle passes a certain area of the beam pipe where there is what is known as radio frequency cavity. There is a short time electric pulse and it gives a little bit kick uh, so that the particle travels faster. And to bend the particles on a curved trajectory we use magnetic fields. So specifically at the LHC we have superconducting magnets there which operate at uh, very low temperatures and we have to cool them down with liquid helium. All right. Let's first look at a very simple particle accelerator that some of you might have had at home at some point. This is basically also a particle accelerator because the way it works is that we produce electrons here and in this part of the monitor or television we have the electric field which accelerates them and later in this second half we have a magnetic field that will bend the electron beam to a certain point on the screen which will then light up uh, because it's covered with some fluorescent material. Uh, the difference between this particle accelerator and the LHC is that here we have sort of a fixed target where we have one particle beam flowing in one direction. At the LHC we have two particle beams going into to opposite directions. And basically we don't have one beam pipe, we have two beam pipes. They intersect at four points where four big experiments for big detectors are located. Uh, and unfortunately I don't have any time to go into details of these detectors. I myself personally worked at the Atlas detector which is uh, basically a common purpose detector. It detects whatever particles uh, can be produced in the reactions. Now one small detail before we uh, go to the particle thing. Uh, uh, the LHC does not accelerate the particles from zero. It's just not possible with the circular design. So what we have there is we have a series of pre-accelerators. We start with linear accelerators, so there's a source of particles. With linear accelerators, they're injected in the first circle where they're accelerated more, then it goes to the next circle, and so on and so on. And all this time they're actually traveling just in one direction. Only here, when we finally inject them into the LHC itself, we have two pipes which go in both directions and in the LHC we have both directions of the particle beams. Now this is a very simplified picture, in reality it looks more like this, but <laughs> let's not go into detail here. So why do we do this? Why do we collide particles at all? What do we expect to find? The interesting thing is that we can actually produce some other particles and this is possible due to Einstein's equation, E is equal mc squared, which means that energy is mass and we can produce mass from energy. And the energy that we're talking about is the kinetic energy of the two particle beams, and when they collide, this energy is set free, and some other particles can be created in this reaction, and we can study them, especially if we find some new particles which we haven't seen before. And here you can see these are two event displays. This is from the ATLAS experiment, this is from a CMS experiment, to uh, which, which show how uh, a collision event looks like in a detector in a schematic way. And uh, uh, you can see that these are some high energetic particles which travel 
uh, basically perpendicular to the beam axis, so the beam axis in this picture goes this way, and in that picture it goes this way. And you see some uh, particles were created which are going perpendicular with high energy, and th these are basically kind of particles that we want to measure. And the rest is a little bit of noise, and we'll talk later about where this noise comes from. So we talked about the collider part, let's now talk about the hadron part. What is a hadron? Now, you might know that there are some particles which are elementary, but then again there are some particles which have even smaller constituent particles, such are, for example, a proton and a neutron. In fact, they have uh, each of them has three constituent particles which are called quarks, and here they are denoted with these uh, colorful circles. There are altogether six types of quarks, in the proton and the neutron we just have two, denoted here by U and D, which means up and down, very original names. Uh, and basically, uh, particles which are made of quarks, they're called hadrons. There are many more than just these, there are maybe hundreds of them, because you can use all six quarks in all kinds of different combinations. But this is not the end of the story, because the quarks have to be bound within a hadron somehow, and this is uh, done by particles which are denoted here as these spirals, they're called gluons, and the word comes from glue, because they glue the quarks together. And they are also reacting, so when we collide these particles, they will also uh, maybe react with other gluons or maybe with other quarks. Now, at the LHC, we actually uh, accelerate and collide protons most of the time. There are also some periods when we collide lead ions. Um, and what happens there? So basically what happens is that maybe one or two quarks of one proton wi will react with the other quark or maybe gluon, and the rest will just scatter, basically. And this is what is producing the noise that we saw in those pictures. So there will be probably one interesting reaction, and everything else will just go around and produce some noise, and we have to filter out this noise, which is uh, one of the challenges at the LHC in every detector. Uh, and this is why usually the physicists say that colliding hadrons is like colliding trash cans, because there is so much trash there. So why do we do this? Why do we collide hadrons? Why do not we uh, do this with some cleaner particles? We can do it with electrons and positrons, which is much cleaner because they are elementary. And in fact, there used to be an electron-positron collider in the very same tunnel this 27-kilometer tunnel. It was called the Large Electron-Positron Collider, and it operated uh, for about 11 years, between 1989 and 2000. So why did they stop using it? And the answer is that they could not achieve a really high energies that they wanted to achieve with it. Now, to understand why, let's take a small break from this. And can anybody tell me what these German words have in common? Anybody got an idea? Glockenspiel, Zugzwang, Angst, Schadenfreude. Anyone? An idea? Exactly. You're absolutely right. These words are also used in, Eng in the English language, just the same way. And there's one more word, which is in fact the answer to our problem, and it's called Bremsstrahlung. This is also an English word, which means something like breaking radiation. Break uh, means deceleration, like a break in the car. And the way it works when a charged particle moves with uh, acceleration or deceleration on a curved trajectory, it actually radiates energy. So what happens is we try to accelerate it, but then it radiates this energy and gets decelerated again. And it's, yeah, it's hopeless, basically. <laughs> uh, so how do protons help? Why are protons much better than the electrons? This is because the intensity of this radiation is proportional to 1 over mass to the power of 4. And we know that protons are about 2,000 2, times heavier than the electrons, so the effects will be 1.6 trillion times smaller. And we can accelerate protons to much, much higher energies, much, much higher speeds. And this is why we use them at the LHC. But we can still build linear colliders. As I already said in the previous slide, we only have the Bremsstrahlung when we're on a curved trajectory. If we're on a linear trajectory, this does not happen. And in fact, a linear collider is currently in planning. They don't know where, it, where they're going to build it yet, but there's been already some work done. All right. 
Now let's talk about some discoveries. Uh, the biggest thing is, of course, the Higgs boson, which is a particle that gives mass to other particles. And it was theoretically proposed by Peter Higgs and his colleagues in 1964. And finally, in 2012, we discovered the Higgs boson at the LHC, and here you can see an event display of one of the candidate events where uh, we uh, are very sure that the Higgs particle was produced and then decayed again. And uh, these guys that we see here are the products of the decay of the Higgs boson. And as a result, these two guys, Francois Engler and Peter Higgs, uh, got the Nobel Prize in 2013. And the results of the Higgs search were published by both Atlas experiment and CMS experiment, the two experiments which detected it. This is the Atlas paper, so you can look it up yourself. You can go to archive.org, enter this uh, code there, and maybe the organizers will also link this paper in the on the Facebook page. And if you look to the author's lists, then uh, maybe you will find my name somewhere here. <laughs> there. Right there. <laughs> Among the other 3,000 names. <laughs> so it's not that cool. <laughs> One more thing that I want to uh, talk about, another big thing, is what is known as quark-gluon plasma. And uh, the thing is that our whole universe was in a hot, dense state. <laughs> and this state <laughs> was quark-gluon plasma. So we already saw that hadrons uh, contain like three quarks or maybe two quarks and a couple of gluons binding them together. But you can imagine if you know what uh, normal plasma is, which is ionized ga gas where electrons and ions are somehow mixed together, this is very similar to that. We have quarks and gluons just moving freely within this plasma. And the, th uh, the interesting thing is that you can achieve this in collisions at the LHC and you can study it. second, the third, and now they're gonna be split into two beams in the opposite direction. They go around the LHC. There's a beam pipe which you might recognize. Uh, yeah, this is our proton with three quarks inside it. There's the collision. There's a, oops. I would like to finish on this slide and tell you that particle physics make the worst biologists ever. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope you learned something new today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yuri. So now we have about five minutes for questions. Anyone have questions? Okay. I'm just wondering how obviously we could change our everyday life. <laughs> That's a very good question. <laughs> the question was how uh, the discoveries at the LHC could change our everyday life. Uh, maybe not really in the next hundred years. <laughs> But fortunately, there are other advantages of doing uh, particle acceleration because we also learn how to build detectors, uh, which may be useful in some other studies where we can have uh, other more quick results. And another interesting thing is, for example, when we started doing physics with protons, we found out that the way they react with matter when they uh, go, for example, inside a, a sheet of matter, they do not give all their energy away at the entry point but a little bit deeper, which means, and, and, and this depth is actually, um, it depends on the energy of the beam. So you can adjust it. And you can use it, for example, to treat uh, cancer tumors, because you can really direct the proton beam so that it will only give it energy away at the place where you have the tumor. So these kinds of things are more practical, and whatever fundamental physics we discover and study, as said, maybe not in the next hundred years. <laughs> 
Thank you for the questions. And which one do you want to take? Uh, I saw this first. first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How many protons did you use for each collision? Um, yeah, so uh, we are talking about uh, not single protons flying around there. We're talking about bunches of protons. And each bunch contains about 100,000 to a million protons. And at the same time, we have about 1,000 or 2,000 bunches in the ring. And we have collisions happening every 25 nanoseconds or something. And every time a huge bunch collides with another huge bunch. So this means actually that we produce much more noise than just from those scattering things. And we have what is known as a pileup effect because sometimes several protons will collide, not just producing noise, but producing some interesting stuff. Um, so this is quite challenging, but on the other hand, it allows us to have uh, many more interesting events, for example, producing the Higgs particle. Yeah. What is the neutron source? We don't have neutrons there. We only u have used protons there because you cannot accelerate neutrons. Pr it's just a hydrogen tank. The, because proton is the nucleus of the hydrogen atom, so we just have a hydrogen tank sitting there. And we bump it into the linear accelerator. Yes? Uh, yeah, so the question was why they built the uh, large electron-positron collider. Well, because at the time they did not go up to such high energies. And because the, the, the real motivation for colliding electrons with positrons is because it has a clean signature. It has no real noise of the scattering constituent particles. So you get a very clean picture. And that's, by the way, the motivation also for the International Linear Collider. What they want to do is, now that we know the mass of the Higgs particle, we know exactly at which energy we would collide electrons and positrons. So with the ILC, we could make um, basically a Higgs factory. Yeah. OK, we have s s a little bit of time for one more question, if there is any other question. Nobody's asking about black holes for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's a discussion <laughs> for the break. Maybe. So, <laughs> thank you so much, Yuri.